Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Horn. I'm Assistant Professor in Intellectual Disability Nursing, and I'm also Chair of the Civic Engagement Committee. I'd like to welcome you all here this afternoon to um, another one of our lectures in the Tell Me About Lecture series. Um, I'd also like to welcome my colleague, Professor Deirdre Daly, who will be making the presentation in a few minutes. I'm just going to give you a brief biography of my colleague, who will make the presentation today. Professor Deirdre Daly is an Associate Professor in Midwifery and Director of the Trinity Centre for Maternity Care Research in Trinity College, Dublin. Deirdre is the Principal Investigator on the Maternal Health and Maternal Morbidity in Ireland MAMI study, which is a longitudinal study exploring the health of and health problems experienced by first-time mothers giving birth in Ireland. Deirdre also leads, co-leads several related studies on maternal health. She's a member of the National Severe Maternal Morbidity and Maternal Death in Ireland groups, and is the National Women and Infant Health Programme's academic partner on the planned evaluation of pilot postnatal hopes. Deirdre's presentation this afternoon will look at what matters to women birthing in Ireland and what women want and need. Thank you very much, Deirdre. Hello, everybody, and a huge welcome to this afternoon's session. They gave me 30 minutes, but I'm going to steal about 40, 45 of your time. But what I really want to tell you today is not what we think, not what we think we know, but what women told us matters to them. So as far as possible and as much as possible throughout these slides, I'll be using the words of the women. I would. Um, first of all, I'm going to present data from three different studies, primarily two studies. And I would like to acknowledge the co-authors, two of whom are in the room of two of the papers, Kathleen and Susan Hannan, and the wider MAMI study team who, this isn't mine, this is us together. So what I want you today is to tell you what we, a little bit, a snapshot of what we learned from the women. Um, grand like that. What we learned from the women about their health, um, what they told us about just a little bit of set the scene of women birthing in Ireland. I know you are a very welcome new higher diploma in middle free students, a lot of you. So it'll be good to see just that overview. It's very brief. What they told us matters to them and why we went and delved it deeper into it. I want to conclude by literally two, three slides on the national and global setting. We collect an awful lot of data on women's health during and after, during pregnancy and during labour and birth in Ireland. But when a woman leaves the maternity hospital, we stop collecting and reporting data. Think about that. We stop collecting and reporting data nationally. Also, the focused moves from the woman to the baby from a legislation perspective. So this research, some of this research is set in the context of the maternal health and maternal morbidity in Ireland study, the longitudinal research, which is research with women and for women to try and understanding our, our try and deepen our understanding, what's it really like to give birth and become a mother in Ireland? What's it like for the woman's health? This study set up uh, was set up 12 years ago now to look at and identify the existence, extent and health problems um, during pregnancy, before pregnancy, during pregnancy and up to 12 months postpartum. It's set also in the context of maternity care in Ireland, which ends at six weeks postpartum. Official free maternity care ends then. Despite that, this huge variation, this huge variation in Dublin, this huge variation in Cork, but there's massive variation throughout the country. And postpartum care is primarily delivered by midwives and public health nurses to varying degrees. 
This is literally a snapshot of women's mainly physical and mental health. One graph, one slide, their health. Think about what you're learning or have learned. We learned that women's health, postpartum care ends at six weeks postpartum when the woman's pregnant, when the woman's body is to, it returns to her pre-pregnancy state. That's a myth for the majority of women. And there's considerable numbers of women who have considerable suffering. Some of them are readmitted to hospital. Some of them get gorgeous help and support when they go ask for it. Some of them are asked about it. Some of them are never asked about it. So this was a sub-study we did with women, both Kathleen and Susie were on this. This was a sub-study that was set up to ask women specifically. These were women in the MAMI study. Okay, you're taking part in this study. What else? do you think is important? And we did in-depth interviews with 24 of the women. This is what we learned. This is what they told us. And two big themes emerged. This pendulum of care, care that swung from absolutely gorgeous to unacceptable. But it also included a disappearing of the woman and the focus became all about the baby. And where that pendulum of care settled depended on the support that she received, either none or excellent. They talked about then this other magnitude of motherhood, the sheer weight of it. But they talked about all of this in the context themselves being invisible to the services and to us. Focus becomes on the baby, the woman becomes invisible. Care was inconsistent. Information was either overloaded or, or, or scarce. It was all about the baby. And this all left them feeling, where do I go? What do I do? Where do I get help? How do I get support? They also talked about the ways of responsibility of that first time motherhood, the responsibility, the need for being reassured, but the real time are changing to advocacy and their growth into identity and that growth into identity is important and you read some more about it later on in the slides we then went back Susie led this gorgeous study we then went back to the same data and to the same group of women and said what's really good what did women say was positive and this ended up in a paper called Positive Postpartum Wellbeing, What Women Say Work For Them. Incidentally, this is co-authored with MAMI study participants as well. So this is why I say the study is with and for them. Three themes were developed. Tone of care, interactions with and attitudes to healthcare professionals. Postpartum presence and flexibility for new mothers. Now for this, women's descriptions of what works, you go out into maternity service and care, you work antenatal, interpartum, postpartum. Women don't talk about their care like that. They talk about the continuum across the whole pregnancy postpartum period, which it's about for them. They're pregnant, they're going to become a parent. That's what they talk about. Women wanted their decision-making respected. They talked about the value of healthcare professionals recognizing their authority, not our authority, theirs, in decision making throughout the whole information sharing process and honoring the woman's decision and decision making power. They talk about advocacy. Remember one slide you saw growth into advocacy. So last first time around, they might have been dismissed, not heard. Dismissed because they're a first time mother, which many women are. This time they know how to advocate for themselves. They've learned that, but they've learned it themselves. They haven't got it from their sort of services. And they've learned it from not being listened to first time around. They wanted family focused care 
Processes that included the partner in all interactions were valued. They were regarded as, when partners were regarded as partners in their care. But that didn't happen for every woman. And women aren't, for many, parenting in isolation. Sorry, it's not on. There we go. They talked about this, the attentive presence of a healthcare professional. Like the words are chosen carefully. It's attentive. You're paying attention to me. Presence. You're physically there. And this was key in offering a woman guidance and making her feel supported. It was something like this, and even the first one, even though it was brief, it was something like this that could boost a woman's confidence. And that's the language, boosting our confidence that's coming out of World Health documents. They wanted somewhere to go, someone, sorry, someone to ask, someone who asks, and then someone who listens. So it's that attention. I want to read out what one woman said. Did they just see me as a vessel? Like, was I just there? The only reason that they're actually minding me was to mind the baby. And I get that, I get it 100%. I get the importance of it. I really do. But like, it's like the second the baby has left your body, literally, they have zero interest in you as a person, zero interest in how you're doing. And that was a real reflection of how postpartum services, services disappeared postpartum when the woman went home. They wanted to be able to ask, they wanted somewhere to go, they wanted someone to listen. For some, there was a complete absence of services. They wanted somewhere to go. And that somewhere to go is and the world is changing now and it's changing with digital and virtual and, you know, audio visual and distance, but they wanted a face to face. And there's something else we'll hear about later on. They wanted continuity of care as well. So, but they wanted that face to face to benefit them. Well, some women were able to attend postpartum breastfeeding support clinics, and these were just like pop up in the community that wasn't available to everyone depending on where you lived and what was available. But when they were there, services like that were suggested as confidence inspiring, even if they were one-stop shops, like a postpartum clinic. Hold those words, which they're the ones that you're going to hear on the second last slide. Women see the pregnancy and parenthood, and parenthood on the continuum, right through to becoming the parent, to becoming the mother, to thinking about going back to work. We don't think of it like that. But the huge costs of high child, child care in Ireland made returning to work unrealistic and unaffordable for many women. And I had to really sort of struggle with the balance of the consequences of returning to work with the cost of childcare. With some women describing this as a lose-lose situation. They were never going to win. They described the real life changes and the impact it had on them. Some didn't have the options.
We want a flexibility for parents themselves and their partner. And women who return to work on a part-time basis or with decreased hours to describe the decision as in the best interests of their family and their own well-being. That wasn't available to everybody. And that's an area that's for future research in Ireland because it's weighted towards women, which has long-term career implications for the woman. That's one study. That's 24 women in this. We're now going to hear stories from different women, also who birthed in Ireland. But it's from women, 736 women who birthed in Ireland between 2013 and 2010. Data from these women were included in this, and this lovely paper was led by Kathleen Hammond. So this is a different study. This was a pan-European survey. These women birthed in Ireland. We got the data from two specific questions, so it was fairly structured. And out of all of that, we identified these themes. Women's interactions with healthcare professionals, Interventions and procedures with less sub-themes, organizational infrastructural issues, and finally, overall evaluations. And that was comments from 125 women who were either really impactful but couldn't be categorized elsewhere. Um, there was five themes in this first one, competence and experience. One of the things within this competence and or one of the things that women described in this was feeling safe, secure, particularly with the competence of the staff, particularly when something didn't go as planned. And that trust and trust is a word that comes across in, the, in several of the studies. They talked about continuity and consistency. And within that, one of the things that were described repeatedly as positive was one-to-one -one care. Within that as well as consistency was care shouldn't stop once you've given birth. So across two separate studies, you're getting women saying the same things repeatedly. And these are women who have birthed right across Ireland. There was one woman and hard reading who talked about postpartum care in hospital being um, absent, really. And she linked that absence of care to her subsequent bladder problems. She didn't feel she got the care and attention that was needed in order to diagnose that injury early. Women talked about respectful care. This was personalized, it was centered about them, it was about the relationship. It was kindness, empathy, and that made them feel positive and had a positive impact on their birth experience. They talked about being treated with dignity and respect, the majority of women and detailed moments of sheer kindness, like this woman here, someone hugged her. But that varied. And there was other women who said that she was scolded. Others came across midwives who were unhelpful. And women described it as being unhelpful in the language that they used at a time when they felt vulnerable. This was one area that a lot of women highlighted as needing attention and needing to be improved. Many described feeling listened to and understood and kept informed. One woman talked about how she ended up with a cesarean section on the doctor and the midwife came down afterwards. Now, you would expect that to be routine practice, but it's something she's pointing out as positive. 
Poor and ineffective communication caused women trauma, unnecessary distress. This is what women said to us. Shared decision-making same theme as came out in the last study. And women acknowledged here that if they had a birth plan, they understood that it may not be feasible or feasible on the day. But they really recognized from the healthcare professional, the midwives and doctors who demonstrated respect for it. Flip that over in direct contrast. There was issues of consent and real consent and procedures being performed without women's consent and permission, which is a major cause of concern and a disrespect for the woman's bodily autonomy. There was women that wrote about feeling scared in our presence and pressured into having interventions and procedures. Now, I read about this in other countries across the world. I haven't regret, I would just deep regret that I say that this has happened here. They described having interventions done which they felt afterwards or they learned afterwards were performed without the consent and weren't necessary. Medical interventions are quite common within the maternity services in Ireland. Some women welcomed them, many didn't. And for the most women in this study, they wanted to get through labour with minimal interventions and to be supported to do so. Within that whole context of their medical interventions was having no pressure and no time constraints to make your decision and being able to have the natural birth that you wanted or preferred. When women were asked about this question, what would have made it better? Or what would you like? Or what would have made it better? Several women wished they had limited medical interventions. And this included a desire to avoid induction. We know it's common in our services. A desire to avoid fetal monitoring because they have to stay in bed and can't move about. And a desire to have access to home birth services or alternative birthing. But there was a, some women who welcomed the intervention and that must be remembered. And they really perceived it in the best interest of their baby. Mm. Breastfeeding support was one issue that got a lot of comments and certainly identified as one area of needing a lot of improvement. And we know that. We know that from our services and listening to women at home. They talked about the inconsistent and confusing breastfeeding advice. And they felt that they didn't receive the professional support or advice to establish it properly. Others wished that midwives had checked things in their babies like tongue tie. And they really felt that that would have pre prevented difficulties that occurred in the longer term. Other women wanted their decision not to breastfeed to be respected. And that's that's where you form the relationship with the woman and you have that respect. You get to know her and you know this is where you're not going to promote it. There was positive comments on pain relief when it related to methods, effectiveness, and the speed of its administration. But there were other women who wrote about not being able to get their type of um, pain relief method, particularly epidural, and felt that the, maybe the midwives took too long, weren't vocal enough to support them in it. Birth partner's presence and support, same as the other one. Women wanted to have a say over who was admitted to the birthing room. That's not always the case. Certainly wasn't the case for women during COVID. And for the hospital to make every effort to include the woman's partner or doula in the experience. 
they wanted their partner. A lot of women wanted their partner to stay overnight, even for the first night. And that's what we should be doing in a service, setting up a family. Facilities and services. It doesn't seem, you think it's down the scale of other issues, but it's not. When you think that it's directly related to privacy and providing private, both physical spaces, but hearing and listening spaces. They wrote about the range of facilities available, and I don't need to tell any of you that a lot of the comments on the facilities in some of the areas in the hospital were less than complimentary. I mean, you're, you're working in two hospitals that are hundreds of years old that are no longer fit for purpose. They talked about though those facilities in terms of privacy and whether it allowed them to be together, whether it allowed space, whether there was overcrowding. If something was wrong, could the woman and her baby be together? Not always. You'll be familiar with this one. Again, women make an awful lot of excuses for us and the shortage of staff. But the truth of the matter is what women want is care. And in this situation where the staff shortages are inappropriate staffing levels, they're not getting the care. Now, it wasn't every woman. There was 50 of the women commented, 50 plus of the women commented on this. But what it did was deny the women the care that they needed deny the women the interactions that they felt they needed with the services, such as helping them to breastfeed or meet their care. Finally, there's very little written on this slide for a reason. So there's 120 comments from 125 women and many of them were fine. Many of the women said, all good, no further suggestions, all good. But there was also extremes of empowering women who had educated themselves during the pregnancy. Everything was perfect. It was awesome. Two, 17 women saying there was absolutely nothing positive about their experience. It's painful to read. The national or the international context, the World Health Organization, and you'll be delving into these, have shifted the focus of maternity care in the last, certainly in the last 40, 50 years, but more so in the recent five years. And all of their key documents about maternity care are on positive experiences. Women expect us to be competent. They expect us to be proficient. If we don't know an answer, they expect us to know where to get the answer, or at least try and find out for them. But they want to leave our services intact at a minimum and feeling good about themselves. The national services are saying the same thing. Our strategy is about reshaping the service so it's no longer hospital focused and moves towards the community. We've had documents coming out of our Department of Health in recent years talking about radical listen, listening to women. And that's one of the key aspects of our role is listen and listen with attention. We had two, three, three, it's four years ago now, for the first time ever, we listened to women's voices about the maternity service in Ireland. And 3,000 women took part in that. And it'll be repeated again soon, within the next year. But one to two years ago, the Minister of Health, and for a variety of reasons, including results from the findings from the MAMI study and things we've been doing a long way, the Minister of Health, um, Minister Donnelly, announced the expansion of postpartum care in Ireland, expansion of other services, but postpartum care.
committed to developing four national postnatal hubs nationwide. I'm delighted to say that they're up and running and we will be, Susan Hannan and I will be starting the evaluation of them when Monday week. Um, so we're delighted. And your take home message, listen to women, really, truly listen to them. You mightn't have all the answers now, but you know where to get them. What really matters to women, and they see pregnancy, birth as the route to becoming a parent, not in the sections that we do, is achieving positive motherhood, including self-esteem, competence and autonomy, as well as fulfilling adaptation to the changed intimate and family relationship, regaining their health and well-being for both the baby and themselves. We heard about some of that and what we've, they've learned from services in Ireland, not all. But when that works well, it results in joy, self-confidence, a woman's capacity to thrive in the integrated new identity of woman and mother. For you and for us as service providers, that women are telling us that they want that to be in the context of continuity of care or get to know you individually, to enable a trusting relationship, to be the decision maker and for us to respect that decision. To involve their partner because he's a partner, he's going to be a parent or she's going to be a parent. They're not a visitor in with them, they're a partner. They want to have someone to, uh, who asks, someone to ask, somewhere to go, and they want to be heard. That's us. Done. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that was really interesting. And it some really, you know, interesting findings that that one wouldn't expect. I think that was what I took away personally. Um, you think things happen in other countries and don't happen in Ireland. And then when you hear about them happening in Ireland, you're thinking, how did that happen? Sure. Um, so Jenny is available with the mic. So if anybody wants to ask questions, um, Deirdre said she'd be happy to take a few. Thanks for the, the lovely talk. Uh, I'm not in nursing, I'm in physiology, so. I know, you're very welcome. Well. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering, there's a lot of talk there, a lot of quotes about being be heard and listened to and empathy and things like that. I am just wondering, what is the standard of the, the overdriving in your dream um, in terms of um, you know, active listening, psychology, mental health support? And then also, what is the provision of mental health care for nursing parents and the midwives who are taking on this burden from their children and having to support them? Or is there is that a case? <laughs> Which one will I start with first? What is the content of active listening? Yeah, I was wondering what kind of, uh, what degree the midwives are trained in um, I'm going to deal with that at different levels. So there's a lot of midwifery students here who are they're about a month old. They um, but some of them have worked in the maternity service before. Active listening, active listening, and attentive listening and communication skills features in across all four midwifery modules. It'll feature in greater or lesser degrees at different points, but it is in from the very beginning and what it means and that's defined. Um, you mentioned active listening when women are in distress. So it's active listening across the whole maternity services rather than just that part of it. 
and active listening, even going back to the first book you visit when you really need to pick up cues and begin to form an empathic relationship. Um, what support is for them when there are issues of distress? Okay, so this is this is going to be difficult to answer because in some instances it's going to depend on the location. So if you're in any of the large maternity hospitals in Ireland, all of them have got perinatal mental health hubs. So they'll have teams of psychologists, psychiatrists, all of those there. So our students will get used to asking women about mental health issues and with the woman's consent, arranging a referral. Um, when something goes wrong, Emergency situations, tragedies, a woman dies, a baby dies, what support is there? There is immediate surround support straight away within the hospital. Long-term support. Um, I'm saying no as an ill-informed no, but a pretty good idea that it would be no. So that there would be, and there would be sort of follow up of, you know, checking in with people that they're all right. With long term support, no. Now, there was another part that I missed. No, no, no. If you want, I'm not running away. Oh, I am running away afterwards, but I'm here for a few minutes if you need. Okay. Um, just a very quick question to demonstrate that this hasn't just been heard in this room, it's also been heard online as well, which is great. Um, and a question from one of our online participants is, Deirdre, do you have any thoughts on the removal of private obstetrics care from public maternity services in the context of your work in listening to women's experience within Irish healthcare? Do I have any thoughts on the removal of private obstetric care? Oh, loads of them. <laughs> Think about this, first of all. If I genuinely stand here and talk about the primacy of women's choice. If, if I truly believe that, and a women's right to self-determine, then they have a right to self-determine to have private maternity care. The other side of that is, they need to understand what genuine, real continuity of midwifery care are is and can do and can help them with in order to not want a choice, not have to buy continuity of carer, not have to buy private accommodation in the, in the maternity hospital because they don't want to be in a 40 bedded ward. So I'm not answering the question, but I'm giving my opinion. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much, Deirdre. <laughs> Um, well sidestepped. Um, does anybody else, would anybody else like to ask a question? We'll take one more question and that's us. Are there what? Litigation, litigations. litigation and complications. Okay. There's, there's a context to that, Luciana, and it um I'm going to contextualize it. In all my life as a midwife, Blanman, I have never met a woman who refused treatment when it was needed for her own health or her baby's health. Never, ever, ever, when it was medically justified. That was in the context of the luxury of having continuity of care or a relationship. And that relationship was based on, this is what you want. 
we will need to talk about if we talk about this. You know, if you really want that, there are contexts to this. And, you know, we will talk about that. We'll take them each step at a time. I've never, ever, ever seen a woman come out. We know for fact and what happens. We know that women leave our maternity services and go free birthing so they don't have any professionals because they've lost so much trust in us. They've lost complete trust in us because of what happened on one time round. So there have been, in the, throughout the 80s and 1990s, UK, US, there have been loads and loads of textbooks written about the worst of it all, the court ordered cesarean sections, both the UK and the US. They never got here. They got to court, but they never got legislation or they through court. I wonder why. It's not that they didn't have it. It's that the women probably acquiesced rather than consented. And we know that. But it's the context. It should never get to that. Once you're in that situation, you're once you're in that aggressive, you're fighting, you're antagonistic. As a healthcare professional, you have stopped being there for her. So again, avoid the question, but it's context specific. It should never happen. Just a huge round of applause for a colleague again. That was absolutely marvelous. Um, um, thank you, everybody, for attending and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Deirdre, as well.